I'm Gene Schiller. I'm a clinical psychologist and also a licensed clinical social worker. What I want to do today is, is look at a way of particularly looking at juveniles and juveniles who are involved with fire setting and to at least be able to make a differentiation between those that are at low risk and then those that are at extreme risk to reproduce the same sort of process to engage in some sort of fire setting behavior. Presently I work for the County of San Diego and work in Juvenile Hall and we have a, a crisis team that uh, deals with the psychiatric issues of, the, of the, the wards that are there. Part of my assignment has been to make assessments of kids because we have a, a camp system. So we have two juvenile halls, one here, in, or just near here at Kearney Mesa, and I guess it's over that way, and then one down uh, in the South Bay area in East Mesa. And uh, usually when the kids are um, uh, taken care of by the court and that will be for a wide variety of things, even uh, things from you know, petty theft to assault with a deadly weapon, everything in between, uh, they're sentenced and part of the sentencing can entail going to one of our camps and we have two camps presently. One's at Rancho del Campo which is just a couple miles north of Tecate and so it's up at a high elevation up in really dry country and the other's at uh, Camp Barrett which is um, about uh, about 15 miles south of Alpine. So they're both in very, very uh, f uh, critical, fire critical and sensitive areas and they're all, uh, I guess the Rancho del Campo are actually like World War I buildings and so they're, they're not exactly, uh, you know, uh, contemporary fireproof structures. So the, the issue of, of, of dangerousness to set fire arose from within the probation. Uh, so they asked me to conduct these assessments and unfortunately there wasn't too much material to work on. As a psychologist I've been trained to diagnose things like pyromania or impulse control disorders and this doesn't necessarily fit into any of that so we're really kind of working outside of the, the normal paradigm uh, that I, I, I'm used to working with. So the, I had to kind of structure and pull together lots of bits of data and I, I finally did and, and uh, borrowed from lots of folks and in the process went to one of the fire academy classes to become a juvenile fire setter intervention specialist too. So it's a nice little title and it gave me access to lots of good, good uh, information too. Um, <clears throat> so in the, the, the process of kind of looking at who is apt to set a fire and who is not, I had to kind of, you know, tease all of this out. So that would be the simplest sort of way if we had sort of a, a binary system we could just say so no I've never had any time that I've played with fire and I have no interest in doing it or yes I have and unfortunately that's for the court's interest that's probably not going to be specific enough because the, the danger is when we deal with this is you know what sort of is the probability that they'll engage in fire setting low or high, and a defense attorney would certainly rip me apart on, on that basis. If I said, yes, the child struck a match once, he has a potential to play with fire again, you know, it's, it's, it's not fine enough. So there are a variety of different <clears throat> models out there. Let's just talk a little bit about some of the developmental things, though. And um, so some folks have sort of divided the, the potential blocks are in, the, in the, actually the developmental stages of, of involvement with fire setting into these four areas. And the first is fire interest. And that's usually somewhat of a natural occurring sort of phenomenon with kids, usually between the ages of three and five. They, you know, t archetypally light candles on birthday cakes, watch people smoke cigarettes watch food being cooked and they engage in play behavior that surrounds those kinds of activities. And on the positive side they'll wear, you know, firemen's hats and play with fire engines and those kinds of things. Other kids will, you know, will, will be building bombs and, and playing with uh, soldiers with flamethrowers. The next, the next stage developmentally is usually around uh, a little bit over five, five to seven sort of thing and this is fire starting. A lot of kids will, at some point, unsupervised, start some sort of a fire. Generally very simple fires, playing with matches, striking the matches, playing with a lighter, that sort of thing. And I'm sure you see a lot of those kinds of kids who it gets out of control very, very quickly. Now if we leave this area un 
unattended uh, and we don't make some sort of interventions, it's quite likely that it starts to grow into fire setting. Because fire is a pretty fascinating kind of phenomenon if you think about the, you know, the, the, the chemical, physical sort of process of, of either heat or, or oxygen and all those things kind of coming together and making this magical thing happen. Um, it's really pretty cool. Um, and so our kids, again, if left unsupervised and without any intervention, will then start to engage in, in fire setting behaviors and that's where it becomes a little more purposeful and they will then advance from the simple thing of say striking a, a match or lighting a butane lighter and holding it to a piece of paper or to brush or, or something like that to then starting to use some accelerants or using pyrotechnics and so it starts to get to sort of it's starting to grow logarithmically and then sort of the end stage is actually a person engaged in arson. And the differentiation between these is that arson is a criminal act and it usually involves intent, an intent to actually do some damage and destruction by the use of fire. The legal sort of issue that, that, that comes in with that too is whether the person at the time knew the quality and the nature of the behavior. So this was kind of a, a, a developmental test. So if you had a a uh, 12-year-old child who was functioning at a 50 IQ uh, and said, yes, I want to burn the house down and, and light, lit the fire, could you legally hold that person responsible, do you think? The answer was it, 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 probably not. It probably wouldn't fly in court because developmentally they probably did not know the nature of it. Uh, it would be arguable. It would be a tough case. But nonetheless, that's sort of the, the difference with, with arson. So there's sort of a developmental progression. And I don't mean to imply that all kids who are at one of these stages will necessarily progress. Unfortunately, we don't have that much data. This is, my, my work is, is, I'll admit it right, right from the beginning, is not terribly scientific. It, it could use a heck of a lot of research. So we've, I'm, I'm sort of working with a, a, a four-part classification. And we're going from, so now we're, we're going to kind of switch and look at once a child has engaged in some fire setting behavior, that second part of that binary model, to, to now look at the, the probability and to divide it into low probability, moderate probability, extreme, or severe. So it's, it's a, it's not, it's a, it is a definitely a continuum. Any idea of what? what sort of behaviors we'd look at for a low probability. So this is a child who may or may not engage in fire setting behavior after this one act. And we'll go to the next one, moderate. Anyone want to take a guess at that? Like more than one fire. Oh, okay, good, okay. So we'll say uh, history of fire. Anything else? Access to. Okay, right. Access to fire setting implements, usually, yeah. And, and when we start to talk about this a little bit more, we're going to look at both the child and the family, because this, this certainly has something to do with family, not just child. Because if parents leave lighters sitting around and they're not there, the, the kid can have those. And any, any sort of sense of any towards the extreme then? What other things? Lack of supervision. That's actually probably going to cover a lot of these. Actually, we right. Okay. Anything else? So let me talk about this just a little bit. The low risk is generally we're going to find kids around ages three to seven, and the the impetus is usually curiosity based. They're interested in fire. They're curious about it. They've seen seen it, and they kind of want to play with it. Uh, it's generally more active children than passive children. I think that shouldn't surprise us a whole lot. Um, and that they tend to be sort of hands-on explorers and, and want to touch and feel and do. Uh, they're generally unaware of the destructive nature of fire because, again, their, their context, their paradigm has been cooking, maybe fireplace, barbecue, so it doesn't, there is no real damage associated with it. And they can be very surprised when it suddenly gets out of control and that there's also a fascination with matches and lighters. And without, again, without intervention, and in the intervention, the family issue is just really, really important. Without that, then this, these behaviors will continue. There's nothing to really stop it. 
The, the family profile, and we'll, we'll go back to families back and forth, uh, a variety of different households will have a, a curiosity-based child. And, but generally, there's this lacking of supervision, and they have the access to the, the, the fire-setting implements. Um, they generally lack any sort of fire-setting education. Uh, they really don't understand it, and they, nobody's ever talked to them and explained that, that fire can be very, very harmful. It can be helpful, but harmful at the same time. And uh, sometimes the parents will actually engage in sort of a denial that their kids are, are playing with matches or, or uh, uh, playing, you know, lighting, burning paper on the stove. Yeah, and, and I think this will be useful because in my work, I, I unfortunately don't have the, um, the, the time or the privilege to be able to meet with the family, so I have to pull together a lot of documents like social, uh, uh, probation officer's social studies and uh, just a lot of historical things because it is important to sort of get a pattern of what the family life is like, what school life is like, all of those other social indicators are going to fit into these, these silos to be able to create that potential. So even though obviously they've all engaged in fire play and there's, we're seeing that lack of supervision starts here, uh, there's going to be a lot more and they'll actually be quite distinct pieces that we can pick up. So I, I encourage the staff to be mindful of those things because you'll, you'll pick up little bits of data and, and all together you'll, you'll start to pick, make some pictures that will answer those questions. A lot of different households with this, the low uh, probability, um, lack of uh, fire education and, and maybe some parental uh, uh, refusal to accept that there is a problem with it. The fire setting behavior is often an imitation of what they see as adults doing. Uh, and then they tend to burn things that are around the home. So with this low probability, it's usually home-based. It's not going out and burning down the forest yet. Um, and they tend to be simple fires, and by simple fires I mean usually one that's combusted from either a naked flame with some sort of a combustible or a match or a, a, a lighter. And generally, the, and we have a variety of different lighters, with a lot of the kids the torch lighters are very popular. They, the longer the flame, the cooler it is, and so they, they can do even more damage. Um, it, they, they may try to put it out. And I think probably a lot of the kids you get have probably done that. Uh, and that's an important thing is when we get on here, there's less of a, of, an, of, a, of a sort of a compulsion to put the fire out. There's more of a compulsion to watch it or come back and see it. So that starts to change things. Uh, they often are in hidden locations, and that also increases the risk for young children. So places like closets, under beds, in uh, storage areas and garages a lot. Uh, where they're out of anybody's eyes and they light something on fire and it, it goes up. And most importantly, at this stage, there's no real identifiable pattern or history. So these are kind of single episode things. Okay, we'll get into the moderate, and we've already talked about maybe there's a history of fire, and then also access to, to a variety of different things. And so this is the moderate profile. Generally, we're going to be looking at kids 7 to 14. That's sort of what the literature is talking about. Um, Oftentimes there's going to be some sort of psychiatric involvement. Oftentimes kids will be, have diagnosis of attention deficit. Probably from here over there's going to be a lot of those kinds of kids. Impulse control disorders um, and a variety of other, other kinds of, of uh, diagnoses such as depression and schizophrenia and those. But it, it's still a, a kind of a minority of that. More of it's going to be very active kids uh, who, who are impulsive. They tend to uh, now start to play with fire more as an act of, of destruction or anger, so there's a little bit of an emotional component, and that often can also emanate from their own sort of sense of feeling helpless or not being able to be in control of the, their own situations. They always have very poor coping sk uh, skills. They have difficult times sort of talking their way through things. Uh, and uh, they lack insight into sort of problem solving. So it's kind of easy to see if they become frustrated, they start to engage in destructive activities. And maybe they're not good at sports or a lot of other things that can be more of a direct expression of that. And so they find other ways to do it. And it, it can be with playing with, with fire. It can often be a cry for help, and this is probably really important to be able to detect these kinds of kids, because these kids were going to be needing some sort of individual psychotherapy as well as family work. But something's, something's not quite right, and it's, it may not be huge, and it may be actually very fixable, 
but, but there's going to be a degree of psychological uh, stress with, within their lives. The, the family profile is going to be a degree of chaos in, at the home, and this can be anything from um, divorce, uh, multiple moves within the house, people leaving, coming, but there's always lots of sort of subterfuge stuff going on. There's very little constancy. Uh, it also raises the possibility that this child may be abused or neglected. And again, that as, as mandated reporters, we need to kind of be very, very sensitive to that. It may not present itself right out, but oftentimes from here over, abuse and neglect uh, and engaging, either the child engaging as in bullying or having been bullied themselves, those seem to be real, real keystones in terms of this, this more severe or moderate to severe uh, uh, profiles. Um, they obviously have very easy access to ignition sources, and that's again lack of, of parental supervision, lack of, of containing these things. Now, I'll, I'll read one report at the end and you'll kind of get a real dramatic sense of how, how egregious that it can be. We're still in the area where they're, they're relatively simple fires, so we haven't gotten to, to sort of you know, really big things going. They're still burning pieces of paper or uh, you know, lighting the cigarette lighter and watching it. Um, it, it it's still very, very simple kinds of fires. And um, as, as again, it said it can be a, a cry for help um, psychologically for the children. We get to the, the extreme, and so we're, this is, becomes more of a delinquent sort of a fire setter. So there's some, some ongoing history and some real press with this. Uh, oftentimes these kids are involved in the juvenile justice system and that means that they've, they could be a variety of different things but they're obviously they're breaking the law and getting caught and uh, sort of have a disregard for social rules and I think that becomes sort of part of the, the profile also. Um, they, uh, they can be, they're, they're definitely impulsive and to this extent they start to become sort of cold and calculating about fire. There's a certain, you'll sense a kind of an emotional removal from that, that they just don't own what they're doing and it's kind of like something that happens. Uh, the family or social picture is one that there's usually a lot of peer domination. These are kids who will go out and in my uh, uh, world they usually say oh my friend started the fire you know they never they're never the one that did it so but there's there's this huge peer influence they often aren't necessarily operating solely by themselves and at this point there's generally a lot of dysfunction in the family and when we're talking about that kind of dysfunction we're really looking at at, at difficulties with hierarchy in other words the parents aren't necessarily behaving in a parental way uh, they are making or throwing decisions onto the kids to make when the adults should be doing it. They're sharing adult lifestyles, their sexual lives with their children. Uh, and uh, so there's a real lack of hierarchy. And then there's also very, very poor boundaries is that uh, everyone's into everyone else's life and nobody has a distinct role. So there's, there's a lot of uh, work that's generally traditionally done with family therapy that would be absolutely necessary for any of the kids in this extreme uh, uh, a category. With the fire setting behavior, we start to see kids lighting fires at schools. Uh, and this, this actually happens quite a bit. Um, and it's usually in two major areas, usually in trash cans. The kids will light a piece of paper and drop it in and watch it flare up. Or in the bathrooms. And probably because of, the, of one common thing is that there's lots of stuff to burn. There's lots of paper that's available and it's usually nobody's observing it so they can kind of engage in that behavior. I dealt with one kid who actually snuck in late at night and climbed over the fence and went into a classroom, stole some things and set the, the classroom on fire and went back out the same way he came in. It was very clever. So that, it's generally not that well worked though, at this stage anyway. We're looking at the, the severe to, to get that. We'll see involvement with fireworks and various types of bombs. Uh, we're looking at uh, axe is the big thing now. The, the deodorant is it's, uh, but it's not just axe. They use hairspray, WD-40, 
almost any kind of an aerosol, which is a you know the propellant and anything that has a flammable uh, uh, aerosol type of a, a component. And kids will play around and figure out which is the best. A lot of the, the kids I've interviewed, and some adults too, uh, that I've had the, the, the opportunity to interview, um, they, they will spray other people. Um, I, one adult I, I interviewed, they were, they were, the whole group was, was intoxicated and somebody passed out and they thought it was funny to spray, spray them with uh, adhesive and then put macaroni on them and then my hero uh, decided to take the adhesive can and, and hold his lighter to it and of course the victim went up in flames. So I mean it's that, that kind of stuff. Um, you have very, very poor thinking. Uh, I haven't met too many that were, I mean, intentional self-mutilation. Uh, uh, most of my kids use razors and fingernails and other things. <laughs> Fortunately, they haven't graduated to, 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 to this kind of level of sophistication. But, 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 but assault onto other people, uh, it, it, it seems to be a fun thing. Mm. Uh, except for the victim, obviously, you know. So, yeah, and, and things like acts are extremely volatile, and uh, uh, but but there's a, a myriad of other things that, that kids have used and, and tried. Um, generally, the the taggers, though, because they really protect their spray paint, they don't engage in this that much, so they uh, they don't want to waste a good product, I guess. Um, and, but 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 there's a use of lots of different common accelerants. Um, and, and obviously, again, a, a huge history of, of fire setting. You're going to see a lot more. And then getting that, that history is, is really difficult. And that's where I had to kind of work that over. Because in my setting, I have kids that will say, oh, no, I've, I don't do that at all. Or they will claim that they've actually been responsible for burning the world down. And the reason that I get this, this sort of strange bifurcation is that if they have a history of fire setting, then they probably won't go to camp. And so some of them don't want to go to camp. So they go, hey, hey, I'm a fire setter. And, and so I've had to develop some interesting techniques to, to try to sort that out. Because I don't particularly want to be involved in preventing them from doing what they need to do and what the judge has ordered them to do. Um, so I, I do, I'll do a, an interview over time, so I'll go in one time and interview them and get as many details of the, the fires as I can, and then go back three or four days later and just track it back again and see as close of, uh, and get the story as close as it possible. And I also use two psychological uh, instruments to be able to detect detent, uh, or uh, uh, any type of lying, or, or, uh, and, and it, it'll measure in both ways whether they're too low or too high on, on those scales. So it's a little bit of a help. but. It's not by, by no means completely uh, foolproof. I'm fooled often. Uh, back to the, the extreme. And um, often this is outside. Um, so we really go from the low ones being sort of inside, concealed, to the extreme being outside, very public, and, or in a public setting. Uh, and, and we see the kids setting dumpsters on fires, alleys. And in here, uh, canyons are, are always ripe for, for uh, catching fire and trash cans, that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, generally, there's a degree of planning with it. It's not just sort of a spontaneous thing. We'll get over here to the se severe or severely disturbed. And this one, obviously, there's a lot more of a psychiatric component, even to the point where maybe they can be psychotic. But certainly, there's some very, very disturbed thinking or lack of, of thinking. These kids are often neglected. There's usually a very profound history of abuse. When we see females, they're usually over here. Very, very few females tend to engage in this behavior. This is, this is, this is a man's world right here. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's, kind of, it's really sad. Uh, sort of the, the issue of self-mutilation is the girls tend to do more cutting on themselves than boys tend to do things to other people or to other things. So, uh, I think it's, it, 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 uh, there's a real gender differentiation. We also, when we start to see the severe, they engage in what's called ritualistic behaviors. And that I don't mean that they burn candles and chant, but just that there's a real tight pattern of, of how they set the fire, that they'll go through the same, say, five or six steps repeatedly. And so obviously with arson investigators, it helps to have that kind of a thing. Um, but, but you'll see that repetition uh, with the severe. Um, 
and the, therefore the fires will have a distinct pattern. They'll use the same sort of accelerants, the same sort of process, and they tend to be uh, very destructive and uh, uh, rather sophisticated. So we've we've looked at at and I think functionally for for our purposes here probably three three main areas below moderate and extreme probabilities of, of setting fires. And the low is typified by curiosity, exploration of the environment, an awareness of the destruction, destructive capacities of fire. Uh, they tend to be super, uh, simple, fi uh, simple fires, like matches, lighters, uh, coming out of an environment lacking supervision and often in hidden locations. In the moderate, we're looking at troubled youth, usually some emotional component, feeling powerless, abandoned. Uh, so therefore their act is con driven by anger and frustration. House uh, living situation is, is chaotic. There's a good possibility that they've been abused. And again, the fires tend to be still simple. The thing that, there's one piece that bridges these two, the, the extreme and the moderate, and that's a history of either being a bully or having been bullied or uh, uh, frequent residential moves. So that sort of fits into that chaotic family. With the extreme, uh, they're going to be involved in the juvenile justice system, be delinquent in some ways, uh, that the intent to damage is there, that they know the danger of fire, they can talk to you about it, they're very well aware of it. There's a peer domination, they, they've lost some of their individuality. Parents tend to defer responsibilities, their fires can be well planned and outdoors. So this is a, a child that was, I think he's, um, he was born in 1990, so he's a 17-year-old. Uh, and I asked him uh, how many times he'd played with matches or lighters, accidentally on purpose, started a fire, or had been with others who did any of these things, and he responded, too many to count. Uh, he acknowledged that he had told another interviewer 100 times, uh, but indicated that he felt pushed, so he just said it. And that's the other thing, is kind of being able to create a relationship with the kids to be able to get the information. It's really, it, it, it takes time, and you can't just kind of go in and say, all right, tell me the story, because it just, um, they're going to, <laughs> like I said, they'll make a story, or, or, you'll, or they just won't say anything. Um, so then he, he indicated that he had set fires in open spaces and structures and some fires involving animals. His fire play had ranged from, uh, at, from about the age of 10 to, to presently. And his last fire involved uh, spraying an aerosol hairspray on the shirt worn by a friend. The two boys were videoing this incident. This is the popular thing. Um, and after the child had set fire to his friend's shirt, uh, and he used a barbecue lighter to then ignite it, uh, the shirt burst into flames, but it didn't flash. He'd expected it to just go poof, like with alcohol. Um, but then the fire continued to burn, and it uh, burned the, the child's upper torso and, and arms. Uh, and he, re he required medical attention. He may have been here. I don't know. Um, anyway, the, the ch my, my uh, minor indicated that the friend's parents became suspicious, and the boys lied about what had happened. So that's the pattern that you're seeing. So further on, uh, this boy indicates that uh, he's also periodically gathered dried vegetation uh, onto a cement slab in the family's backyard and doused these piles with gasoline and set them on fire with either matches or a barbecue lighter. He's also indicated that he'd set fire to vegetation in public parks, noting that his house was located near several parks. He reports that he's gen generally been able to suppress the blazes with his shirt, but on at least one occasion a tree caught fire. Uh, he set fire to an abandoned couch and then ran away and then came back later to discover the couch was missing. And that's also with the extreme, you're going to see that kind of coming back to check out and see what the damage was. Uh, he's often used an accelerant such as WD-40 combined with butane lighters to make torches. Uh, he usually runs from the scene and sets fires at night to avoid detection. And with, with these kids in this moderate to low, usually the times of fires are usually, I think, between 3 in the afternoon and 7 in the evening. With the more extreme and the older kids, it's usually from 10 at night to around 3 in the morning. So there's a, that's kind of an interesting sort of a thing. Um, you know, he, he claims that he's played a, 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 lot with, uh, f uh, a lot of fires in garages or laundry rooms throughout his community. So some of that's this kind of hidden sort of behavior. 
Um, and he's burned rags, stuffed animals, and carpets. For some reason, stuffed animals are big with a lot of these kids. I, must be a lot of. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah. And he explains that his father possesses many different chemicals due to his work in construction, and he's noted that he'd test the chemicals for volatility before using them to burn other objects. So it's almost kind of a scientific process. And again, that's this, this sort of, I mean, real condensed, cold, calculating, uh, methodical sort of process. He reports that he's set fires to, an to animals such as frogs, crayfish, and rats. He's estimated that to be about 100. Uh, he's used uh, agents such as hairspray to douse the animal and then set them alight with a barbecue lighter. And he described watching an animal crawl away and roll on its side before expiring. So again, that cold, cold calculating, real detached sort of stuff. Um, he indicates that he started small melting plastic at home and continues to play with various flammable objects. And he's reported uh, placing cherry bombs in uh, mailboxes and tossing cans of accelerants into open fires, watching them explode on at least three occasions. He set off fireworks, notably firecrackers and skyrockets, and uh, he gets them from, from a variety of different friends. So the biopsychosocial piece indicates that his fathers uh, disciplined him by grounding. Uh, and this is the piece where you probably want to ask a little bit, because you start to get some sense of abuse or certainly a very authoritarian kind of, of, of parenting style. Um, and he's resided with his father, stepmother, her son, and two younger brothers. Uh, father and his partner have separated, so again, you're getting this sort of chaotic, sort of lack of stability. Uh, he describes the house as being con uh, confusing and chaotic. Uh, he's done poorly in school, received suspensions and expulsions for fighting. That's usually par for the course. He claims to have used marijuana twice at 14 and alcohol about 10 times at age 10. And you, with a lot of our kids, there's a real profound drug and alcohol usage. Um, he's uh, been the victim of peer abuse. Due to his, uh, he had sort of um, a, a nice stigmas with his eyes. So lots of kids would make uh, fun of him. And so as a result, he got really picked on and, and brutalized at a young age. So again, that sort of starts to fit these, these, these uh, conditions. Um, and he's also been arrested for grand theft auto, resisting arrest, truancy, and curfew violations. So he's certainly active with the juvenile justice system. Um, uh, and psychologically, and I do a very brief sort of a psychological thing, I don't, I don't have the opportunity to do a, a, a wide uh, battery of, of tests, but he, he presented as a kid who would readily engage in, in fighting. I usually ask him a, 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 the, you know, the, one of the big taboos or, you know, is, what would you do if a bunch of kids you didn't know said some really awful things about your mother? And that's usually a little, you know, spark them. And he would, you know, well, I'd beat them up. And it was just not a hesitation, just right into it. So the, a sense that this kid isn't going to hold back on his emotions very much. It's a slim test, but I think it still gives a, you know, a picture anyway. And, um, it, and he's, he has had in the past a diagnosis of psychosis not otherwise specified. And me medications were recommended. I don't think he ever f uh, followed through on it. Um, but on the tests, he actually came very low for lying which is kind of an interesting, because this would be the one that if, if he told you all of these things, or if he told me all of those things, I'd question, hmm, you know, is he making this up? Um, but but you know, the, the index for lying was very, very low, so it looked like he was actually quite honest about it. And this is one of the few kids he also qualifies for a diagnosis of pyromania because of the affective involvement when he does uh, engage in fire setting. So, so this is a, a kid who's in the severely disturbed profile again. So it's it's very very rare. We don't see that many. Most of them are, are in, in this area, probably with the bulk being, thankfully, in the in the low section. So.